All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. It is Saturday, February 3rd, 2024, and we are live. So this is our class introduction to a uh, 10-week online course that I'm teaching called Ancient Kemet, which is one of the original names for Egypt, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So I've been teaching this class on and off for seven years. It's taken seven years to develop the class to where it is today. So you're in for a fantastic uh, history course that deals with thousands of years of history, okay? And you're never going to look at history the same way. All right, now we know we're going to have some people uh, that are going to join us throughout this class today. And what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to do a, a entry. We'll do about a um, one hour or so introduction to this course. And then we'll start with class number one uh, next Saturday. So you're going to learn a lot. Uh, if you register for this class, there's some bonus content that you can watch also. It's whenever you get ready to, it's on demand. And also, I'm going to upload the uh, class lesson plan for all 10 classes. I have the class lesson plan, class lesson plan laid out for all 10 classes because I was working on updating all of that this week, this uh, the, over the past few days. I just finished doing a broadcast on our social media platforms dealing with uh, Denzel Washington going to portray Hannibal Barker in a Netflix movie directed by Antoine uh, Fuqua. And we talk about Hannibal Barker here in the class because we deal with different uh, ancient African empires, especially those that Europeans tried to claim as their own, okay? And Carthage was one of those, okay? So we have the link here if you missed it. Um, I posted it here. Um, dealing with uh, uh dealing with that topic and uh, and this is the link here on our youtube channel michael m hotep i m h o t e p okay so we're running behind schedule today uh it's been a crazy day and i had um uh phone calls some issues i had to take care of uh issues at work that um somebody on my staff called me so i had to take care of some things here we're running behind schedule but i had to do this broadcast also before we started uh the class today all right so um can everybody hear me i want to go over a few housekeeping things can everybody hear me can you see me okay uh we're broadcasting through crowdcast now crowdcast is the platform that we use to actually broadcast the class Crowdcast recommends that you use Google Chrome to actually watch the class. You can use Firefox, but Crowdcast recommends that you use Google Chrome, okay? Now, if you watch on a smartphone, you'll want to uh, turn on auto-rotate or portrait, whatever it is, so that when you turn the phone sideways, uh, it reorientates, okay, and gives you a wider screen. All right. And if you watch on a smartphone, you may want to use earbuds as well. Uh, so this class, we're going to uh, there's over 200 slides in the class. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, uh, all of that. OK, so. Uh, let's go to the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we'll look at a little bit of this here and. Also, what I want to do is I want to deal with some of the history of um, African-American History Month, Black History Month as well. OK. All right. And then give you a preview of um, what we'll deal with in this class. Also, uh, you can post here. Uh, what what are some things that you want to learn in this class as well? OK. What are some things you want to learn in this class also? All right, so this is Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, okay? And this is uh, 2000, uh, uh, March 23rd, I mean, uh, February 3rd, 2024, February 3rd, 2024.
Okay. At the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. And you can email me, AHN show at the African History Network.com, AHN show at the African History Network.com. So, this course, and I've taught it in over eight weeks, I've taught it over 12 weeks. This here is going to be uh, 10 weeks plus the first class is going to be introduction. Then we're going to have 10 weeks after that, pretty much. This all evolved from a four and a half hour lecture that I did January 24th, 2014 called understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. And this, this, uh, lecture came about because of a number of questions I was getting from people across the country. You know, I was doing the African History Network show on Blog Talk Radio, Thursday nights, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is even before I started doing local radio uh, on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF, the African History Network show. This is before I started doing that because I didn't start that until, didn't start that show on 9, 10 a.m. WFDF until April of 2016. So, I'm doing um, blog talk radio. This is before I got on the Empowerment Radio Network with Warren Valentine and uh, Professor Griff was on the uh, Empowerment Radio Network early on. And uh, William Martin came later. We know Dave Anderson, uh, founder of the Empowerment Radio Network, Nasty Syndicated Radio. That's before I started doing Nasty Syndicated Radio. So this lecture came about because of so many questions I was getting. So I put together this lecture to deal with this history chronologically. And one of the things I saw that was missing was the connection between the history of the African Moors in Europe, taking the teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa into Europe. And these teachings will bring Europe out of what are known as the dark ages. And uh, the connection between that and the transatlantic slave trade and the connection between the Moors and ancient Africa. That was largely missing. The other thing that was missing from the narrative is the African presence in the Americas dating back tens of thousands of years ago, okay? That was also missing as well, okay? So those are some things I dealt with uh, in this presentation. All right, now, some of this we'll uh, get to uh, next class, but one of the things I also dealt with and this connects us to ancient African history, is, is, is who Imhotep was, okay? Who Imhotep was. So um, Imhotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, Imhotep was one of the greatest people who ever lived in human history. Uh, it's pronounced Imhotep, it's pronounced E-M-H-O-T-E-P. And Imhotep comes from the ancient Medu Nadu language of the ancient Egyptians. And it means he who comes in peace. Okay, he who comes in peace. So, uh, and these are the ancient Kemites, uh, ancient Egyptians. Now, these were black Africans. These weren't Arabs. These weren't the, the, the Arabs that are there today. That, that's after... Uh, Egypt is conquered by the Arabs in 642 Common Era AD. Imhotep was a high priest. He was a physician, architect, mathematician. He was designer of the Step Pyramid at Saqqara in um, designer of the Step Pyramid in, in, in Saqqara uh, in Egypt as well. And uh, that's the uh, third dynasty. That's for the Subiti or Pharaoh Zosier of the third dynasty. And he's known as the world's first multi-genius, okay? Uh, and he's going to live somewhere around 3000 BC. You'll see some variations in period that he lives. Um, some, uh, some will put him somewhere around, um, yeah, somewhere around 3000 BC. Uh, this book here, The Egyptian Philosophers, Ancient African Voices, from Imhotep to Akhenaten by uh, my friend Malefi Keti Asante 
uh, talks about Imhotep also. Okay. And hold on. Let me. Yeah. This talks about Imhotep as well. The Egyptian philosophers, ancient African voices from Imhotep to Akhenaten. Okay. And he talks about. Uh, he talks about ancient philosophers, Kagimni, Sanchi, um, Imhotep. Um, Imhotep, they put around 2700 BC. You'll see variations, him living somewhere around 2700 BC to about 3000 BC. Depending upon which timeline of history you're looking at, it can be 200 to 300 years old. So because I know at least 130,000 years of our history has been stolen, I'll go with the oldest dates that I can find. All right, now, let's go back to this here. And let me change this around. Okay, so, These are some statues of Imhotep also, okay? Um, some famous statues of Imhotep as well that we see. Now, this is Imhotep. This is not Imhotep. In the 2001 movie, The Mummy Returns, the villain's name was Imhotep. Consequently, many of our children think that one of our greatest ancestors was evil and not of African descent. So in, so in this movie, The Mummy Returns, they have, um, uh, in this movie, uh, The Mummy Returns, they have uh, this Arab Eurasian looking actor named Arnold Vosloo portraying Imhotep. Okay. And in the movie, he's evil. So many of our children see this and think that one of uh, the greatest people in human history was not of African descent, one, and was evil, two. Just totally distort the history. Now, here is a, uh, here's, here's a picture of the Step Pyramid at Saqqara designed by Imhotep for uh, Pharaoh Zosia. So Imhotep was the architect of this pyramid. Now, this is a early form of pyramid building called a um, mastaba, flat bench pyramid, mastaba, flat bench pyramid, which is different than the pyramids like we see at Giza, okay, which are more sloped, uh, more intricately designed. Pyramid building technology is going to evolve over hundreds of years. All right, now, um, what I want to do here, let's look at the pyramid principle quickly, and then I want to deal with some history surrounding um, Black History Month, okay? Because like, like I said, uh, we're going to do an introduction today, and then uh, there's some bonus content when you register for this class that you can start watching right now. And then next Saturday, we'll jump in with class number one because um, class number one is going to be about three hours because of the amount of content I have to cover. So this is one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. And when Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor James Small teach, they uh, talk about the pyramid principle. Pyramid has three sizes, the Pyramid of Khafre at Giza. Uh, the foundation is African history and culture. Our foundation is African history and culture. It gives us our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. This gives us a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. And it gives us our self-identity. It gives us uh, our self-esteem, our self-development, our self-worth, our history and culture. People's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. You've heard me say this on the African History Network show. You also hear me talk about how what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you 
and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do it, teach what it doesn't know. Now, there are two sides of the pyramid. There's economic empowerment. Economic empowerment deals with our economics, how we engage in economic empowerment, business development, business ownership, how we engage in economics, and how we use our economics as well. Do we give away 97% of our dollars with people that don't look like us? Do we, um, it, uh, do we participate in conspicuous consumption? And trying to keep up with the Joneses and the Combses and the Kardashians? Or do we use that to uh, acquire property in our community, own the grocery stores, the gas stations, the radio stations, the TV stations, have control of the political structure in our community, have control of the educational system, buy up the property in our community? And do we utilize the uh, cooperative? cooperative economics, the co-ops, the cooperative system, or do we get engage in uh, white capitalism dressed up in red, black, and green? That deals with our economic empowerment, okay? Then the other side of the pyramid is our political empowerment. Now, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. OK, uh, voting is one aspect of politics. Voting is not politics, is not the total extent of politics. Voting is extremely important. And this is why I say we have to top, we have to stop telling African-Americans to exercise your right to vote. You don't vote for exercise. If you want to exercise, you go to the gym and work out. You vote for power. You vote for black power. You vote to put it. You vote for policies that are beneficial to you, your family, your community. Policies that are beneficial for African Americans are good for America in general. You vote for people who are going to put policies in place that are beneficial to you. You vote for people who will protect gains that have been made, and you vote also to stop threats, to, to vote people out of office who are trying to do you harm, generally speaking, and vote to keep people out of office who are trying to do you harm, generally speaking. So we have to understand. So we have to have a synthesis of all three of these and all three of these work together. Politics impacts every aspect of our lives from the water we drink to the air we breathe to the food we eat. Politics, politics impacts our economic empowerment and impacts the business environment, whether you have zoning laws that determine what type of businesses can be where and certain types of businesses can't be within uh, a certain number of feet of churches or schools. Uh, how many liquor stores can be in, in, in the city. It deals with uh, zoning laws when it comes to restaurants and uh, restaurants having liquor stores and you have to get a license from the state to uh, have a liquor license. OK, that's all politics. That's all dealing with regulation. So we talk about politics when it deals with policing, when it deals with voting rights, when it deals with the courts. So this is why it's important to understand the U.S. Constitution. OK, in the second class that I teach uh, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement and Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968, we get deeper into uh, understanding the U.S. Constitution in that second class as well. And your understanding of history, your understanding of politics is directly related to your understanding of history. Your understanding of politics is directly related to your understanding of history. Right now, you have talks about the. Uh, uh, section three of the 14th Amendment, okay, of 1868, which is the result of uh, the Civil War ending, slavery ending, and this is uh, one of the uh, three uh, one of the uh, three Reconstruction uh, amendments to the U.S. Constitution, okay, uh, the third uh, the uh, 14th Amendment section in section three of the 14th Amendment deals with. Um, People who participate in an insurrection being barred from uh, holding political office. OK, this is this is Section three of the 14th Amendment. So a lot of people 
try to act like, oh, this history is all in the past, has nothing to do with today. That's false. That puts you on the trajectory to understand how you got to where you are today. And we're still dealing with the aftermath of the U.S. Civil War, the aftermath of slavery, Jim Crow era, where you had a rewriting of the state constitutions, um, rewriting of the state constitutions going back to uh, 1868 when Florida wrote their state constitution and opposed um, uh, felony disenfranchisement laws. And you lost your right to vote for life. And that was targeting African-Americans because African-Americans were 48 percent of the population of the state of Florida. In 1868, three years after slavery ended, we look at uh, Florida uh, being the first state to impose poll taxes. 1889, 1890, Mississippi State Constitution of 1890 rewrites the state constitution to impose poll taxes and literacy tests to suppress the African American vote. Okay, this is at a time when you have African Americans in Congress. And then we're going to see other southern states do do the same thing. This is after Reconstruction is after the uh, after the fall of Reconstruction in 1877 with the Compromise of 1877, which was uh, and one of the things that led to um, uh, Reconstruction ending was the uh, political violence that was inflicted upon. Uh, African-Americans and white Republicans who uh, many at the time were allies of African-Americans, the political violence that, that was inflicted. OK. Coming from the Ku Klux Klan and other groups, the the uh, the White League, the Knights of the White Camellia, these different domestic terrorist organizations. All right. Now. Let's continue here. OK, so. Uh, I want to, I want to go to, um, I want to go to look at the lesson plan for this class here. How's everybody doing? Can you all hear me? Okay. So let's go here. I have the lesson plan in a PDF. Right here. And I'm going to put it in our in the in the class on Learn World. OK, so when you register for this class and Learn World, I have to upload it, upload this uh, to the class in Learn World because Learn World is the platform where this class is where these class sessions are housed and this course is housed Podcast is the platform that we use to actually broadcast uh, this class live okay all right so if we look here and i'm gonna i'm gonna walk you through um highlight some some of the um topics that we deal with here in this class and let's zoom in on this Took me uh took me some time to put all this into the um class outline format. Okay, so here we go. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understand the transatlantic slave trade with a den teacher in school, instructor myself, historian Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network. So here's some things that we deal with, and we'll get into this starting next class. Okay. Dink Nesh, uh, who Europeans call Lucy who uh, dates back 3.2 million years ago. She was Australopithecus afarensis. She was known as the mother of humankind, discovered in Ethiopia in 1974. Um, there's a timeline of history that we use in this class also from blackpath.org. I'll show that to you as well. So um, in, we look at this timeline of history going back hundreds of thousands of years, going back 5 million years ago. Uh, we talk about, we'll, we'll talk about the Berlin Conference. The Berlin Conference to Divide Africa, the colonization of the continent by European powers, the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885. And we'll look at what uh, this is where the colonies come from during the colonial period after basically pretty much after slavery ends. Uh, these European nations dividing Africa up into colonies and the geographical boundaries that exist today in Africa largely come from the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885. And there were no African representatives at this Berlin Conference either. 
Okay, there were no African representatives at, at the Berlin conference. All right, now um, we have, um, let's see here. What determines when Easter is celebrated? So we, we talk uh, we talk a little bit about this history and astronomy, but uh, dealing with things that are outside the circumference of our own awareness, dealing with things that are outside the circumference of our own awareness. Um, I, I like to talk a little bit about because uh, in the uh, introduction and also in class one, we deal with um, laying the foundation to get deeper into this history, because I know people are coming to the class with different levels of understanding of history. OK, so we do a laying a foundation that we can build upon to actually understand this history. And one of the things we talk about is Juneteenth. Because Juneteenth became a federal holiday in 2022. And it's very important for Juneteenth to be a federal holiday because that's the only uh, holiday that, fe that federally recognizes slavery in this country. OK, Juneteenth, as I as I have been teaching, can, can become a powerful tool to fight for and to help us get reparations, meaning repairing the damage of a legacy of slavery, uh, Jim Crow segregation redlining, racism, housing discrimination, et cetera. But we have to correct the history of Juneteenth and protect the history of Juneteenth because Juneteenth was not the last day of slavery, okay? June 19th, 1865, when Major General Gordon Granger goes into Galveston, Texas, um, that was not the last day of slavery because uh, you had some states that didn't end slavery till December 6, 1865, like Georgia. And the 13th Amendment is not ratified until December 6, 1865, when Georgia ratifies the 13th Amendment. It, the 13th Amendment did not become law until December 6, 1865. That's six months after Juneteenth. OK. And the Emancipation Proclamation did not end slavery either. OK, so we'll, we'll talk about that some next class. Um, who was M. Hotel? We'll, uh, we'll talk about that and we'll get deeper into that next class as well. The world's first multi genius. The attack on African-American history and Black History Month, the attack on African-American history and the attack on Black History Month that we've seen across the country. And there are articles that deal with how because of this anti-critical race theory movement, it makes it harder to teach African-American history during Black History Month because there's so much uh vagueness about these laws and teachers are confused about what can be taught what cannot be taught then we also saw uh florida attacking the advanced placement uh college african-american uh, studies course as well right now uh we'll deal with how americans know very little about uh juneteenth also uh, we'll look at the difference between dating systems, uh, B.C. and A.D. dating systems. These were popularized by an English monk uh, called the Venerable Bede. Um, we'll look at we'll talk some about the 1619 project uh, spearheaded, you know, from The New York Times spearheaded by Nicole Hannah Jones. Because one of the problems, uh, there's some things that. There are some things that are good in the 1619 project. But one of the problems with the 1619 Project is it gives the impression that uh, African people first came here in uh, August 20th, 1619, which is not true. Uh, 1619 did take place, but we were here for tens of thousands of years before that. It doesn't deal with the African presence in the land we call the United States of America or what some Native Americans call Turtle Island. It doesn't deal with that history going back, um, you know, 51,700 years ago at least. Okay, 51,700 years ago at least. It doesn't deal uh, with that history. Okay, so those are some of the things that we that we talk about here in this class. And we deal with how um, a lot of what we know about um, 1619 is correct. It is incorrect, okay? Much of what we've been told about Virginia's 1619 uh, first Africans is wrong. And there was a lot of information that came out 
um, in 2019, which was the um, 400th year anniversary of August 20th, 1619. Uh, we'll talk about the year 1526 because the Spanish were taking Africans into the uh, area that we call Georgia and South Carolina in uh, 1526. Okay, this is 93 years before uh, August 20th, 1619 in Jamestown, Virginia. All right. Okay. So those are some of the things that we'll deal with in uh, next week. Okay. When we deal with um, really class number one, uh, we'll talk about the, uh, now one of the things we deal with here in the class is the film Black Panther, uh, you know, Wakanda from Marvel, because the film Black Panther is a very powerful movie. Uh, I did extensive research on the film. I have a three hour lecture that I've done on the film. It's about three months worth of research. The, there are 11 different African uh, cultures that we see represented in the film Black Panther. So uh, we talk about that film here. And, you know, Ruth Carter, the costume designer, she did research for six months on 11 different African cultures. And we see all that represented in the film. So I'm going to show you some of that here in the class. A lot of people thought it was just some made up stuff, a made up movie. No, no, it's not. OK, everything from we see ancient Kemet represented because Bast, the panther deity, Bast, that watches over the people of Wakanda. That comes from Bastet, who was an ancient deity in ancient Egypt. We talk about uh, Bantu languages. Um, the word Wakanda comes from. Uh, the word Wakanda uh, comes from, uh, it's a Bantu word, but it, we see uh, uh, see it in Key Congo, the Key Congo Bantu language. And we know Kanda, the word Kanda in Key Congo means family. But Wakanda is also a, a Native American word. We see it in the Omaha, Ponca, and Sioux Indian languages as well. And it means possesses secret powers. So they have all this in, in this movie and a lot of our people just are totally oblivious to it. So the film Black Panther deals with African history, African culture, African language, as well as African spiritual systems. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the state of Maryland. Did you know that Maryland did not abolish slavery until two years, almost two years after the Emancipation Proclamation? Maryland did not abolish slavery until November 1864. Okay, the state of Maryland. And they had to put it on the ballot and it almost did not pass. Uh, this is a good article from the Washington Post called The Not Quite Free uh, State. Maryland dragged its feet on emancipation during the Civil War. OK, so that's basically uh, class number one. Now, in class number two, we're going to get deeper into this. There's a slide from uh, the Richard Pryor show, 1977, I like the show, which deals with why the knowledge was hidden from us. And um, it, it depicts Richard Pryor as a uh, archaeologist in 1909, and they come across uh, the book of Coming Forth by Day or the Book of Life, and you'll see what happens. There's an attempt to keep that history hidden. Uh, we'll, we, we talk uh, some more about the film Black Panther. We deal with what is Bantu, what are Bantu languages. Uh, also, we'll talk some about the mythology the rich mythology uh, that we see in the film Black Panther and uh, the real life African and indigenous inspirations behind the folklore of behind the mythological lore in the film Black Panther. Uh, there's a clip from Malcolm X that I like to show uh, in my presentations and in my classes. And Malcolm X uh, asked the question of who are you? And this deals with the importance of understanding our history. Now, I also deal with the fact that Malcolm uses the term African-American in the Ballad of the Bullet. He used it uh, April 3rd, 1964 in Cleveland, Ohio. And he used the term African-American uh, March 29th, 1964 in Washington Heights, New York as well. Uh, a contrary to popular belief, the term African-American uh, dates back to uh, 1782 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was not created by Reverend Jesse Jackson. I don't know why. People uh, just more simple Simon nonsense people put out with absolutely no research done. Um, but the term African-American is a very old term. 
uh, Je Reverend Jesse Jackson re reintroduced the term 1988-1989. Uh, Reverend Jackson and the team of uh, African American scholars. He did not create the term African American. We were calling ourselves African Americans in the 1960s, and Professor James Small told me this personally because he was there. Also, the term uh, Afro-American dates back to the 1830s. That didn't start in the 1960s. So we'll, we'll talk some about Dr. Francis Cress Wilson and the book, The ISIS Papers. I, I knew Dr. Wilson interviewed her three times on the African History Network show. Um, there's uh, some information that I deal with dealing with the Essence Music Festival from 2023. And, you know, uh, the dehumanization of African people and uh, Megan Thee Stallion's performance, Janelle Monet, and the criticism NDRE had of Megan Thee Stallion's performance and Janelle Monet. Uh, and then uh, the pyramid principle also of Dr. Linda Jeffries. Uh, so there's a clip from Kathleen Cleaver, uh, the Black Panther Party for Self Defense, that deals with why we wore our hair naturally uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, uh, especially early 70s. Um, and then we will talk some about uh, Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. Now, you know, I interviewed Dr. David M. Hotep uh, 13 times on the African History Network show. You know, he passed away in 2023. So he's an ancestor now. Uh, he was a friend of mine and I uh, attended his funeral virtually. I couldn't make it to Virginia uh, for the funeral. But uh, I attended it uh, virtually while it was live. But his book deals with, is backed up by 713 footnotes, seven peer review articles. And his book explains the African presence in the land we call the United States of America dating back at least 51,700 years ago based upon archeological evidence. We'll talk some about the Khoisan who have the oldest DNA on the planet and go all around the world, the short statured Africans, the Khoisan. Um, and we'll talk about Africa's oldest ethnic group uh, in their fight, the Khoisan, in their fight to keep their ancestral land away from Amazon. There's an article from face2faceafrica.com about this. Now, one of the things that we'll look at here in this class are archaeological discoveries, okay? And archaeological discoveries that have come out in the last 15, 20 years um, that cause scientists and anthropologists and archaeologists to push the timelines back, okay? And there's one dealing with the Greek island of Crete and stone tools that are found that date back 130,000 years ago that uh, basically show an African presence on the Greek island of Crete 130,000 years ago. We'll talk about Sarah Bartman, who was Khoisan as well, uh, who was um, paraded around Europe in a, a circus that traveled throughout Europe in the early 1800s. And She's going to be, uh, she turns to prostitution as well. She dies when she's about 26 years old, possibly suicide. But I relate the mistreatment and the uh, sexual dehumanization of Sarah Bartman, Sarah Bartman, Dr. J. Bartman, to adultification bias in African-American girls. And how studies show that adults perceive African-American girls to look older, need less nurturing and know more about sex than their white than uh, white uh, their white counterparts. And this is a legacy of slavery that we still see perpetuated in media today, especially negative corporate controlled hip hop. And it has a detrimental impact on the way African-American girls are perceived as well as see themselves. OK, so that's uh, class number two. Now, class number three, we get deeper into archaeological discoveries that prove that we are older than we thought. OK, so uh, we'll continue with uh, the study for uh, dealing with the Greek island of Crete. There's a good article from The New York Times that deals with this. We'll talk about the lost city of uh, the lost uh, city of Egypt called Tanis Heraklion. Now, there are two lost cities of Egypt that would deal with Tanis Heraklion, one which uh, we found out about in 2013. But then also uh, there's one called uh, Dazzling Atten that we found out about in about 2021 or so. Dazzling Atten. And that's named after Aten or Akhenaten, um, 
who was the uh, 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 Akhenaten, who was the uh, Amenhotep IV, who changes his name to Akhenaten, okay? Uh, we'll deal with the discovery of 17 pyramids that were found buried buried underneath Egypt. This, this was in 2011. 17 pyramids found buried underneath Egypt. Because you're going to see that you're going to have civilizations built on top of civilizations. Um, so we'll look at archaeological discoveries. We'll look at what are, we'll, we'll get a better understanding of cooperative economics and the co-op systems. Uh, the cooperatives, because these were principles that we brought with us from Africa. These are ancient African principles. And one of the things that I point out in my lectures and in this class is that all the great African civilizations that we like to talk about, and we'll deal with some of those here in this class, they all had some type of political structure. They didn't just have African history and culture. They didn't just play drums and wear African clothing and speak an African language and eat African food. They had control of natural resources. They had farming. They had control of agriculture. They grew their own food. There was some type of economic structure. There was an African marketplace. They did trade with other uh, nations. And they had some type of political structure as well. So that should tell us that is not just going to be African history alone and playing a djembe drum and speaking Kiswahili or speaking uh, Wolof or speaking Yoruba that's going to empower and save African Americans. We're going to have to have a synthesis as we saw in the pyramid principle. We're going to have to have African history and culture that gives us our values, our interests, and our principles. We're going to have to have economic empowerment and we're going to have to have political empowerment. We have to have a synthesis of all three, not one or two out of the three. We need all three. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, the co-ops. Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated in 2023 opened a credit union. Credit unions are one of the most popular forms of co-ops that exist today. And we'll deal with, we'll look at some work from Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard, who wrote the book Collective Courage. And this is one of the best books dealing with the history of the co-ops. Uh, and we'll look at we'll look at some information of her from her, because like I said, this deals with uh ancient African principles, the cooperatives. And when we go back and look at our history going back to Say, for instance, the Free African Society in 1787, which was a co-op. We look at the Colored Farmers uh, Union, uh, 18, about 1882 or so, the 1880s in Texas. Uh, we look at the Colored Merchants Association, 1928. The economic empowerment that we had, even during slavery amongst free African-Americans up north, we're going to see the cooperatives play a large part in that. When we talk about Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it wasn't just the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866, which gave a lot of those people land who were uh, former slaves of the Creek Indians, okay? But it was also the, um, uh, what is it, the, the 1881, the, um, um, is a cooperative, the, the, the reformers, um, uh, it was a cooperative in 1881. Okay. I talked about this in my lecture with, um, Dr. Daryl Scott, where we dealt with, um, Ava DuVernay's, uh, documentary, the 13th, and why it's historically inaccurate. Uh, we'll talk about how the father of all humankind is 340,000 years old. Okay. This is a good discovery that came out around 2013 or so, uh, yahoonews.com had an article dealing with this as well. Okay, so that's class uh, three. And then we'll deal with um, uh, another discovery came out June of 2017 in Morocco that showed how uh, they found remains of homo sapiens that date back um, 300,000 to 350,000 years ago. And this is at least 100,000 years older than 
the oldest remains they had at the time that dated back about 195,000 years ago that were found in Ethiopia. And what and when these discoveries take place, the scientists say this is causing them to rethink everything. OK, now. African centered scholars like Renoko Rashidi, Dr. Charles Finch, Dr. David M. Hotep and others have been saying that Homo sapiens are at least 300,000 years old. Not 75,000 to 100,000 years old. When we look at these archaeological discoveries, we see at least 130,000 years of our history has been stolen. OK, that's why these archaeological discoveries are so important and they're showing that we're much older than we thought. And when we look at the work from Dr. David M. Hotel, we see that African people were here in the land that we call the United States of America thousands of years before we thought, even before Native Americans came into existence. Now, this does not mean the transatlantic slave trade does not happen. People keep looking at it as either or. No, it's both. Yes, the transatlantic slave trade happened. Going back to 1441, when the Portuguese go into uh, what was today known as Mauritania, that, er that area. Yes, the transatlantic slave trade happened, but you have to understand history that existed thousands of years that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. That's one of the reasons why I teach this class. So we can look at like 50,000 years of history as opposed to 500 years of history. We'll deal with the African presence in uh, Asia and, and the Khoisan and, and look at uh, some excerpts from work from um, Renoko Rashidi. Um, we'll talk more about Sarah Bartman. And also there's a discovery that came out of California in 2017 where they found master bone, uh, they found uh, remains of a, a mastodon, uh, a, a mastodon, uh, which is a prehistoric uh, animal. And these uh, date back about 130,000 years ago. And the scientists are saying that the skeletons were smashed apart by humans. Now, if this is correct, this puts, now African people were the only humans on the face of the earth at this time. This is before Europeans came into existence, before Native Americans came into to existence. This puts an African presence in California 130,000 years ago. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. Okay. All right. So that would conclude um, class three. So then for class four, we're going to continue our look at uh, archaeological discoveries that keep pushing the timelines back. Um, there was an article from the New York Post. Humans are 100,000 years older than we thought. Um, we'll deal with the African presence in Asia, looking at the Negritos, who were short-statured Africans, who were the first inhabitants of the Philippines. Um, there's an excerpt from Hidden, Hidden Colors 2, dealing with the African presence in Asia we'll look at. We'll talk about the uh, Centralese, the Africans in the Adaman Islands, um, and these endangered um, uh, Africans, these ancient people. Uh, and then there's a good article by Renoko Rashidi uh, dealing with before enslavement, Africa's ancient diaspora. And we'll look at some uh, ancient African history as well. We'll talk about the lost city of Egypt uh, that's about 3,000 years old called Dazzling Aten. Dazzling Aten, uh, the lost golden city of Egypt. Uh, and we'll look at the judgment scene in ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, where we see uh, Asar sitting on the throne of judgment. We see the scales of Ma'at. We look at from this mythology what comes from it, okay? We'll talk about the Omics in the uh, Mandinka, Egyptian Omic connection that Dr. David M. Hotel deals with um, in his book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, page 82. And then there's an excerpt of um, an interview that Rock Newman did with Tony Browder. Um, 
because we use some of Tony Browder's work here in the in the class. And I'm going to show you excerpts of interviews I've done with Tony Browder also. Uh, black Egyptians entered America 2,500 years ago. OK. Uh, also, we'll look at the um, voyage to the Americas that was made by Abu Bakr II in 1311 AD. Now, in class number five, we'll deal with Egypt on the Potomac, and we'll look at excerpts from uh, we'll look at excerpts from the book Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder, which deals with how the layout of Washington D.C. is a copy of ancient Africa. Okay, and we're going to get deep into this history. Um, We'll look at an African presence in early America before Columbus and slavery. Uh, we'll look at uh, ancient Nubia, okay, that goes back 4,500 BCE before the Common Era. And ancient Nubia, we know, is the mother of Kemet, the mother of Egypt. And there are twice as many pyramids in this so, old. In ancient times, the lower portion of Kemet and the upper portion of, uh, sorry, today, let me rephrase that. Today, the lower portion of Egypt and the upper portion of Sudan in ancient times is what was called Nubia, okay? Nubia or, or Ta-Nehisi. Uh, Ta-Nehisi basically means the land of the black-skinned people. So we'll talk some about Nubia uh, as well, the mother of ancient Kemet. Uh, Amana Shakito, who was one of the queens of uh, uh, Nubia or, or, or Kush, the region Kush, who was also known as a Kandaki or you, uh, what you he would hear referred to as the Candaces, the Kandakis. We'll look at Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. And I'm going to show you an interview that was done on News One Now with Roland Martin. Uh, attorney Mo Ivory was sitting in for, for Roland Martin, and they interviewed Tony Browder talking about Egypt on the Potomac, how the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of ancient Africa, of ancient Egypt, and the symbolism from ancient Egypt that's all throughout Washington, D.C. Uh, we'll talk about the Omic heads in uh, Mexico uh, as well. And the Tekken, the Tekken is an African symbol of resurrection coming from the story of Asar Aset and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Okay, so this takes us uh, to you know what was worshipped now from us uh, from uh, Aset and Heru. This is where you get the Black Madonna and Child, you know, that was worshipped in uh, Egypt. Oh, sorry, sorry. that's worshipped in Europe. The Black Madonna and Child is worshipped in Europe before uh, the Moors go into Europe because we know that deities from ancient Kemet influenced the deities in Greece and Rome, okay? And we're going to show you some comparisons between that. We're going to show you some relationships between those deities. But this is um, a Tekken, okay? Now, the Washington Monument is a Tekken. The Washington Monument is an ancient African symbol of um, the resurrection of Asar. And we'll get into the story of Asar, Aset and Heru, Asar, who's the first king of, of Kemet, of Egypt in the mythology, and he's cut up into 14 pieces by his brother Set, and his wife, uh, Aset, who the Greeks called Isis, finds 13 of those 14 pieces and puts them back together. And the 14th piece that was not found, she erects a Tekken to symbolize the resurrection of Asar. The, the, the last piece that was not found was the phallus, the penis. There were about 1,200 Tekken new all throughout ancient Kemet. Today, they're less than 12. And some of those have been taken to other parts of the world, okay? 
like Istanbul, Turkey, Paris, France, London, England, and New York City. So they have stolen artifacts from Africa. We look at those artifacts and identify, we, we associate Greece with them, or we may associate New York City or anything other than ancient Africa with uh, uh, associated with those artifacts. The Washington Monument, we, uh, the presence of Africa in the Washington Monuments or that African symbol, we know comes from Freemasonry because the foundation of Freemasonry are the teachings coming from the ancient Egyptian mystery system in ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. And we know George Washington was a Freemason. We know that 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. So we see Africa represented in all of this. Okay, so these are some of the things that we're going to uh, deal with here in uh, this class. Let me go back to the timeline, I mean, not the timeline, the outline of this class here. And I'll put the link here for the outline so you can, uh, it's in PDF form. I put it, it took me a while to put all this together, then save it as a PDF, okay? Uh, so we'll look at pages 10 through 20 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. If you don't have the book, that's fine. I'll show you uh, excerpts of the book on the screen. So that's class number five. Now, class number six, we'll get into the African origins of Star Wars and the Osarian drama. Osarian drama deals with Osar, Osset, and Heru. I'm going to show you an excerpt of the interview. Uh, I'm going to show you an excerpt of an interview I did some years ago with one of my teachers, Professor Kaba Hayawatha Kamene, where we talk about uh, why ancient Egyptians stopped building pyramids at the end of the sixth dynasty, right around 2300 BC. And we talk about the African origins of Star Wars. And I'm going to show you an excerpt of an interview that um, George Lucas, who's the father of Star Wars, who created Star Wars, George Lucas did talking about the influence that his mentor, Bill uh, um, um, Joseph Campbell had on him. And Joseph Campbell taught him about myths. One of those myths was about Asar, Aset, and Heru, Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Because if you understand the Asarian drama, you see it represented in the movie Star Wars. And uh, Darth Vader represents both Aset, I mean, he, he represents both Set and Asar, okay? Uh, and Luke Skywalker represents Heru, and Luke Skywalker is wearing, wearing white, uh, and he represents good. Darth Vader represents evil. But at the end of Return of the Jedi, um, Heru, or Luke Skywalker, is able to resurrect the good Anakin Skywalker, who is who Darth Vader was before he became Darth Vader. He's able to resurrect the good out of Darth Vader. Uh, before Darth Vader dies. And you see uh, Darth Vader kill the emperor, okay? So we see all this represented in the movie Star Wars. And what's interesting about Star Wars is that, now I saw Star Wars when it originally uh, was in the theaters in 1977, okay? I saw the first Star Wars when it originally came out in the theaters in 1977. One of the amazing things about Star Wars is that people thought they were looking at the future. But at the beginning of Star Wars, when the uh, movie, they, they have the prologue and it's scrolling across the screen and it tell, it's giving you the background story, it says uh, in a a land a long, long time ago in a place far, far away. You think you're looking at the future, but you're actually looking at the past in Star Wars. You're looking at, you're looking at advances in technology, right? You're looking at 
uh, understanding the force in the universe. So class number six, we'll deal with the African origins of Star Wars and the Asarian drama. We'll look at another um, archaeological discovery that came out in the last few years. Uh, an ancient beer factory was discovered in Egypt that dates back 5,000 years ago. Now, this wasn't St. Ides. Most likely they were using this beer for ceremony or for medicinal purposes. We'll look at page uh, 95 of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization from Tony Browder. Fantastic book, okay? Probably one of the best books, probably one of the best books you'll read dealing with African history. Uh, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. Let me see what we need to do. I want to do this here. This book right here. Now, once again, you don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class. We're going to show you the extras, but if you want to buy them, that's fine. I don't sell them. I'm, I'm going to start selling some of these books. But as of yet, I don't. Um, okay, let's go back to this here. Okay, now, how's everybody doing? Because, like, you all are extremely quiet. Last person that said something was Stephen or Stefan, like, 58 minutes ago. Are you, is everybody okay? I mean, so, <laughs> is everybody still there? All right. Uh, let's see here. Let's go back to this. Crowdcast changed their... Uh, menu here, the options, their controls, and I'm still trying to get used to this. Uh, we'll look at uh, Egypt on the Potomac, pages 21 through 27, where they talk about Benjamin Banneker and the surveying of Washington, D.C. Benjamin Banneker having a photographic memory, but also is believed that Benjamin Banneker's grandfather, whose name was Banneke, is believed that he was Dogon. And we're going to talk about the Dogon of Mali and Burkina Faso, who originally come from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, who have a superior knowledge of astronomy. And we'll talk about the Sirius A and Sirius B star systems, okay? Uh, because a according to Dogon mythology, um, the, Go the Dogon say they come from the star Sirius, okay? S-I-R-I-U-S. And they talk about Sirius A and Sirius B star systems. Uh, we'll deal with the, uh, I'm going to show you an excerpt of the interview I did with Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene dealing with the African origins of Star Wars. We'll talk about why uh, the ancient Egyptians stopped building, building pyramids in the third dynasty. Uh, I'm going to show you a excerpt of the interview I did with Tony Browder where we talked about the origin of the word pyramid as well. And the fact that there are no, uh, they did not use the pyramids as tombs. There are no uh, Nesubites or pharaohs buried in the pyramids. They were buried underneath the pyramid, okay? So we're going to dispel a lot of this nonsense that's out here. We'll talk about Queen T of the 18th dynasty, who was the wife of Amenhotep III. She's the, mo she's the mother of Akhenaten. Um, who was Amenhotep IV, who changes his name to Akhenaten. And, 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 and Queen T is the grandmother of Nesubiti or Pharaoh Tut Ankhamen, who they call King Tut. We'll talk about the relationship between Memphis, Tennessee, and Memphis and Egypt. And Memphis and Egypt was originally the city of Menefer because Memphis, Tennessee is named after Memphis and Egypt. How many people knew that? Who... who had have not taken this class before. Uh, and then we'll wrap up class number six, dealing with this, um, an example of the suppression of this knowledge, okay, of, of this knowledge of African history, African spiritual systems, et cetera. And we'll, we'll show an example of this during uh, with the fight against the Druids in Ireland. And in 432 AD, uh, Pope Celestine I sends a British slave uh, named Patrick into Ireland to convert the Irish to Christianity. And you hear me, you may have heard me talk about 
the fact that um, Patrick was a, a mass murderer who killed thousands of Druids on behalf of the Christian church? Well, we're going to talk about that. Now, this is not an attack on anybody's religion. This is not an attack on anybody. If you want to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, you can go ahead and get as drunk as you want to, if you want to. And, uh, I mean, uh, okay, you can. <laughs> this is America. But <laughs> as you've heard me say before, I'm not telling you don't celebrate these European holidays, but you should at least know the history of what it is that you celebrate. Okay. You should at least know the history of what it is that you celebrate. You know, if you, um, how should I put this politely? Um, well, let me, let me put it to you like this, right? So when the George Floyd protests were going on in 2020, I ain't participated in any of the George Floyd protests. You can pro you can eh, you can protest if you want. You need meaningful change. You need policy changes. There's other things that need to happen. You can protest if you want to. But but here's here's the main thing. See, I live in downtown Detroit. There are protests taking place downtown. I didn't know who was organizing the protests. I didn't know who was organizing the protests. I see all these white people in downtown Detroit protesting with signs saying "F the police." Well, all, all types of stuff. I don't know who these people are. And um, you had, and then it goes into, I'm trying to get the timeline straight. Okay, so May 2020. And you had, um, because COVID was out at that time also. And I remember a lot of people were wearing masks, you know, surgical masks because of COVID. I don't know too many stories about black people dealing with crowds of white people wearing masks that turned out well for us. Maybe you know some, I don't. So it's like, wait a second. I don't know who's organizing this protest, these events. And then you got a bunch of people with masks on and you got a lot of white people from the suburbs coming into downtown Detroit. And one of the problems was activists, black activists from Detroit, even though there are problems with the Detroit police force, we don't have those problems like they do in other cities. So you had like white people from outside of the city and in some cases, probably outside of the state, bringing an energy into the protests that a lot of people, a lot of black people inside the city and a lot of black activists weren't projecting that type of energy. There were, there were instances where you have white people that want to throw a brick through one of the stores in downtown Detroit, and there's black people saying, Wait a second, what are you doing? We ain't trying to do that. Because a lot of those white people that were doing it don't live in the city. So they can go back out to the suburbs, wherever the hell they came from. They can go back out there after you come and trash Detroit, and then we get blamed for it. So. All right. Is everybody okay? Everybody's so quiet. I don't, I don't understand why, but all right. Okay, let's see. I, I want to go back to the uh well, let me let me go to this right here. Maybe I should have started with this. This is my disclaimer. Okay, so <laughs> I talk about expanding the circumference of your own awareness. I got this from one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Higgins of the African Village in Atlanta. So usually when I do my presentations and do my classes, things of this nature, uh, I usually have people put their fingers together to form a circle. And I usually say something like this. The space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. Everything that I think I know about whatever I think I know 
is represented within the circumference of this circle. I must keep in mind that there are still things to know that exist outside of the circumference of my own awareness. So just because you know everything that you know about what you know, does not mean you know everything there is to know about what you know. There's still things that exist outside the circumference of your own awareness. Okay. And for those who want to practice, participate in uh, European holidays, um, I, encourage, I encourage you to read the books from um, Dr. Ishaka Musa Barashango. African People and European Holidays and Mental Genocide, Book One and Book Two. Book One and Book Two. Okay, but Dr. Ishaka Musa Barashango. So I'm not telling you. Now, I've done, uh, I've studied the history of all the holidays, and you see, we have broadcasts I've done uh, recently, last couple of years, dealing with uh, Easter, Christmas. St. Patrick's Day, all of that. Okay, so you can go watch those. We have them on my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P, my Facebook fan page, the African History Network. You can watch all that. So I'm not saying don't participate in those holidays, but you should at least know the history of what it is that you are participating in, because that will probably change how you decide to participate in it. Okay. Also, this is the book I was looking for, Collective Courage, by Dr. Jessica Gordon Emhart. I interviewed her around 2014 on the African History Network show. A History of African American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice. This is one of the best books dealing with the history of African American cooperative economics, co-ops. So that's why we reference this in this class that helps give us a foundation to understand the history. This is what I'm telling you. It took seven years to develop this class to the point that it is. OK, so I want to go back to uh, the uh, class lesson plan that I've put together because I developed the curriculum. I did put together over 200 slides. I developed the course outline, all of this. Now, class number seven, we're going to deal with. Um, Hannibal Barker. The Punic Wars. Hold on, let's see if we see. Class number seven will deal with Hannibal Barker, the Punic Wars, and the African Moors who take the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, into Europe. So in this class, we, we look at this information chronologically as much as possible. Okay. Sometimes we go a little bit out of order, but we try to deal with it chronologically as much as possible. So uh, Carthage existed 813 BCE to 146 BCE. We'll talk about the Punic Wars as well between Carthage and, and Rome. Hannibal Barca and the Battle of Cana, 216 BC. Uh, we'll do with Hannibal being defeated at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC. We'll talk about why Africa was not named after uh, a Roman general named Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. OK, uh, we'll look at the development of uh, European societies based on uh, the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, the, 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 the develop uh, the development of European secret societies, I should say. OK, that's an excerpt uh, from um, uh, Anthony Browder's book, Now Valley Contributions to Civilization. Who was Bishop Nicholas who became a saint? Now, Bishop Nicholas was actually African. He was a. Um, saint uh, from, uh, he was a bishop from Myra, uh, third, uh, third and fourth century AD. And um, he became canonized as a saint. Uh, basically fourth century BC, uh, fourth century BC in Myra. He was uh, of African descent, but a lot of your early Christian saints were Africans also. We'll talk about center class, uh, who, and from center class, which is Dutch, uh, center class means uh, St. Nicholas. This is where you get Santa Claus from, from um, the Dutch uh, mythological character of center class. And, and, and center class had a sidekick, center class had a sidekick named Joata Piet, Black Pete. 
and Black Pete was a Moor. So we're going to get deep into this history because this shows more evidence of the uh, history of the Moors in Europe also, dealing with uh, uh, center class, joie de Piet, and the celebration of uh, uh, center class coming into the Netherlands in early November. And he comes on a steamship uh, from Spain. And Spain is where the Moors go in in 711 AD. It was called the Iberian Peninsula at that point in time, 711 AD, but that's Spain and Portugal. Okay. Uh, Joao de Piet, Black Pete, was a Moor who was a helper of center class. He is still celebrated in the Netherlands today. Europeans put on blackface, an Afro wig, gold hoop earrings, and parade around as Black Pete, Joao de Piet. We talk about what patron saints are and what is their relationship between patron saints and Christianity and the Netaru in ancient Kim and ancient Egypt, who were the deities, okay? Uh, the deities in ancient Kim. Uh, who was Queen Charlotte Sophia, who was of African Moorish ancestry? And she was the wife of King George III in England. And King George III is the king that the 13 colonies are revolting against during the American Revolutionary War, 1775 to 1783. We'll talk about who were the Moors uh, as well, okay? And we have a, a, a video clip to show you dealing with who the Moors were. We'll talk about the origin of the word Moor, and uh, we'll deal with uh, the Moors going in into the Iberian Peninsula, first in 710 AD, Common Era, for the reconnaissance mission, then in 711 AD, led by led by General Tariq Ibn Ziyad. And they're going to uh, conquer the southern portion of Spain, and then they're going to go all throughout Europe. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the patron saint of Germany, St. Maurice, who was a Moor. And why are there African Moorheads, African Moors heads, on the national flags of Corsica and Sardinia? Corsica is a French island in the Mediterranean. Sardinia, Sardinia is an Italian island in the Mediterranean. So we'll deal with that in class number seven. We'll get into uh, understanding the history of the Moors. Class number eight will deal with uh, how did the Moors lose power in Spain? And we'll talk about the Crusades starting in about 1096 AD, Common Era, and the rise of the Spanish conquest. And we'll talk about Christopher Columbus in the Renaissance era, Christopher Columbus and setting sail August 3rd, 1492. Later in the same year that the African Moors in, um, uh, lose control of the last stronghold in Granada, January 2nd, 1492. Okay. We'll look at a clip of a, a lecture from uh, Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, who also has a essay in, he has an essay in the book, uh, Golden Age of the Moor. In Golden Age of the Moor, is one of the best books dealing with uh, the history of the Moors also. Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Renoko Rashidi has an essay in here. Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, Dr. Jan, uh, um, Dr. Well, Jan Carew has one, Dr. John G. Jackson, but also uh, Dr. Wayne Chandler, because I've interviewed Dr. Wayne Chandler years ago, interviewed Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay 2010, I've interviewed um, Renoko Rashidi six times. So this is a deep book, Golden Age of the Moor. So that's one of the books that we reference in the class also. Now, let's see here, let's continue. So then we'll, uh, we'll look at the Crusades and the Dark Ages, medieval period, uh, First Crusade, 1096 to 1099. We'll talk about who were the Knights Templar. Who were the Knights Templar? Uh, and the Knights Templar were taught by the African Moors, and they're taking the teachings from ancient Africa, and they're learning from the Moors. Uh, and we'll do with how the Knights Templar lost power as well. What's the connection between the Knights Templar and Freemasonry? We'll look at excerpts of Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust, Slavery and the Rise of European Capitalism by Dr. John Henry Clark and the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade in 1441 with the Portuguese. 
Now, class number nine will deal with the doctrine of discovery, dumb to verses, 1452. Uh, we'll look at what a papal bull is coming from the Catholic Church. The Treaty of Tordesillas, June 17th, uh, 1492, where the Pope divides the non-Christian world between Spain and Portugal and sends them out to conquer the non-Christian world. Uh, we'll look at uh, Spain beginning to take African slaves into uh, the Caribbean islands right about 1502. Okay. This is after, uh, uh, Columbus, this is after 1492. And, uh, we know, uh, Columbus goes on four voyages and he never comes to the land we call the United States of America. The closest he comes here is Cuba, which is, uh, about 90 miles away. We'll look at the expansion of the transatlantic slave trade. And, and, and usually when, conversations of the transatlantic slave trade take place. The Asiento uh, of August um, 1518 under King Charles V is not talked about. The Asiento de Negros, and this drastically expands the transatlantic slave trade. And we, we deal with the role that um, um, Right Reverend Bishop Bartolomeu de las Casas has, um, where he that is constant calls for the um african people to be enslaved as opposed to native americans to a lesser extent he says white people but it's going to be majority african people um and he's trying to save the souls of native americans and he says they suffered enough he later quickly regrets it and reverses course but it's pretty much too late by then We'll look at what was the middle passage of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, we'll analyze the essay that Dr. Malefi Dr. Keti Asante wrote refuting the op-ed article by Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. in 2010, the uh, op-ed article that Henry Louis Gates Jr. wrote for the New York Times called um, Ending the Slavery Blame Game where Dr. Gates blames puts equal blame and culpability on africa and africans as he does on europe for the transatlantic slave trade that's just since that's simple simon ass nonsense that's just blatantly false uh and gates whole game is to absolve europeans of responsibility for um reparations culpability for reparations all this gates is backed by european corporations like bank of america you look at the ones that sponsor his um knowing your roots on pbs all of this this is gates whole game we'll look at when did the first um uh, african come to america that we know of by name we'll analyze bacon's rebellion of 1675 and 1676 in virginia that planted the seeds of race-based slavery, Bacon's Rebellion. And these rebels in December of 1875 are going to burn down the town of Jamestown, Virginia. And they're made up of uh, enslaved African people, free African-Americans, white indigenous servants, poor whites. But it's a fascinating history. And, and it plants the seeds of race-based slavery, because it's going to be after this that you're going to have African people enslaved in the colonies for perpetuity. You're going to have chattel slavery. It's going to be after Bacon's Rebellion. And it's going to be right about 1781 in the colony of Virginia that they're going to start using the term white widespread to describe what we call white people, to describe Europeans, to break up the alliance between poor white people and African people. It's a fascinating history. And we're dealing with the consequences of Bacon's Rebellion today. We'll deal with the uh, history. Did African-Americans own slaves and why we'll deal with that complicated history? Uh, because about half of the slaves that were owned in this country, right around, let me see, it was about, right around 1840 when, uh, when Dr. Carter G. Woodson looked at 1840, right around that period of time, about half of the slaves that we own would have been family members because you had 
African Americans who got their freedom, who bought other family members out of slavery, who, you know, who who bought their family members to get them out of slavery, to get them away from slave owners. We'll deal with the fake Willie Lynch letter 1712. I hate to break your heart, but Willie Lynch never historically existed. Okay, this is class number 10. So that's concludes class number nine and class number 10. The fake Willie Lynch letter 1712 will deal with the tragedy of the slave ship, the Lusden, uh, January 1st, 1738. The origins of negative uh, images in the media and how they're rooted in slavery. And, you know, we'll conclude with, you know, some more questions and answers. Now, you can ask questions all throughout the class. There may be some additional things. There are going to be a few other things that I add in as well. But that gives you a basic framework understanding of uh, this course. OK, so how how's everybody doing? How do you like the content here that I've laid out that we're going to cover uh, here in this course? What do you think about it? Do you think you learn a lot in this class? I'm going to post the link here. And I think that's a link that you can, uh, you should be able to, that's a PDF form. We're going to put that also in our learn, in um, the course in Learn World, where our online school is, Learn World. You'll be able to download it from Learn World. I have to uh, 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 add that in, okay? All right, now, if, um, okay, the link won't, yeah, well, uh, I'll take care of that. Uh, we'll put that in the Learn World class, okay? Uh, the link. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Because I did that. Uh, I created the PDF, so we'll get that uploaded to Learn World, so you'll be able to um, view that and download it. Okay. Now you can register for this full class at our website, um, theafricanhistorynetwork.com or africanhistorynetwork.com. Got both domain names. It's right at the top of the page. So when you scroll down, you'll see it. And let me flip over to this here. Yeah, you scroll down, you'll see it. Uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, 10 week online history course. It's on sale $80, regularly $130. You can use your debit card or credit card. We'll make some, uh, updates to the website but you can use your debit card or credit card just click right here register here it takes you to uh, our learn world page and our learn world school and let me flip over to that just a second here and what you'll do is just click on uh, enroll where is that Uh, hold on, go to this here, where, right here. Okay, so it takes you here at uh, our online school and scroll down. Okay, so just click on enroll. Okay, and it has a description here also of the class, but just click on enroll and uh, it takes you through, um, let you, uh, you type in uh, your name, email address, create a password, and it'll go ahead and process the payment for you. All right. Now also, um, we have in, digital download format um, a 15 lecture bundle pack that i've done over the past few years this is african history awakens the african mind for mental death and it's a collection of uh some of my lectures 15 you actually get 16 because you get the black the lecture I did on the new Black Panther movie, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, from November 22, 
November 2022. So you actually get um, 16 lectures. This is uh, on sale, $75, okay? And it lists all the lectures here that you get as well. So I'm gonna put this link here. This is in digital download format. If you want it in DVD format, uh, DVD format is $100, but um, digital download format is uh, $75 and you can start watching that right away. All right, so that'll keep you busy, especially for African American History Month. You can share that with your children also. You can, uh, this content for this class, you can use with your children. I would say the content is PG-13. It's not overly graphic. I don't do a lot of cursing, anything like that. It's nothing like that. Um, so you can use this with your children also. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, 80 to 100 articles we reference. So it's very interactive as well. You can ask questions here and you can uh, email me also. Uh, like after class, if you have questions, you can email me as well. A-H A H N show at the African History Network dot com. A H N show at the African History Network dot com. You can email me. Now, if you want to uh support us through Cash App or PayPal, you can do so. Um Dot, we, we you have the information on the home page of our website uh, but dollar sign the ahn show through cash app and through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show we have that information there and i put it on the home page of our website because um some people set up uh fake african history network cash app accounts and they've been stealing money from us so i'm still trying to get those um shut down let me post this information here Okay, yeah, just posted it right there. And we have it on you scroll down the website and I'm gonna I'm gonna move it farther uh towards the top of the website as well because I'm working on updating the website. Let me show this to you here. Okay, right there. Okay, so you scroll down, information on the class, information on our, uh, our radio show, our broadcast, the African History Network show Sundays, 9 p.m., 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, digital, our digital Sunday night show, and it's an audio podcast platforms, uh, uh, it has a link there to our blog talk radio page. Uh, then we have right here, PayPal Cash App. So this is our Cash App, our, our Cash App tag, dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W, through Cash App. Now, these other ones here are fake African History Network Cash App accounts. There's six of them out there that I've identified. I'm still trying to get them shut down because Cash App is slow as hell. But the, all these other ones out here are not me. They're impersonating us. They, they've been stealing money from us. So that's why I put our link here as well. That's why I created this graphic. Put the link here. Click right here, Cash App, on the link. That's our QR code. Okay, so that's our actual Cash App tag. And uh, that's our QR code for Cash App. Then we also have the information here for PayPal as well. Okay. All right. So look, that's going to uh, do it for us. Do uh, you have any questions before we get out of here? Who still needs to register for this full 10-week online class? Today was an int uh, introduction. We're going to get deep into the class next Sunday. There's some bonus content. When you register, there's bonus content that you can start watching as well to get ready for the class. We'll get this um, course um, outlined, the lesson plan. We'll get that uh, in the learn in the learn world uh, account as well uh, for this course course offering. So you'll be all set. But you're going to learn a lot. Uh, your understanding of politics is directly related to your understanding of history. And um, you've probably never seen a class like this before. It's taken me seven years to develop the, the class. 
to the point that it is now. So I'm pretty happy uh, where it is now because I knew where I wanted to get the class to. Uh, but it took time to get it there. And I have like most of the articles, things like that in the binder. So this is, now which binder is this? Because I have two binders for my second class that I teach. Hold on, these are all books for the class. The, um, this is a file folder on reparations. I'm doing some uh, lectures and work on reparations. This is my file folder dealing with reparations. For those that don't know, so like this is the I do extensive research. So these are just this is half of one of the two stacks of articles I have next to me. This is half of one of the two stacks of articles. I have like thousands of articles printed up here in the office. Um, I need to clean out my file cabinet or get another file cabinet, one of them, because my file cabinet is full. This is, I want to show you this, um, where is, okay, this is my file folder, uh, Christopher Columbus. It's right here. Uh, because Columbus is crucial to understanding the transatlantic slave trade and the expansion of the slave trade. Okay, so the file, for the binder for this class is that's one, two, should be down here at the bottom. Let me see which one is this. Now, this is for black resistance movements. Oh, I think this is it. Okay, that's black resistance, and then there's this one here. So two classes that I teach, and I develop um, the curriculum for both classes. So this is the file for this is not file for this is the the uh, binder that I teach from with the articles that we deal with in the class and things like that. And I have it broke, broken broken uh, broken up into class sessions. So it's taken seven years to get this course to like this point where I really wanted to be and get my class lesson plans developed in advance of teaching all the classes so now i've got this is the first time i got all my class lesson plans laid out so <laughs> i'm really feeling pretty good about myself <laughs> all right all right look we have to get so did y'all have any questions before we get out of here y'all still so quiet all right so tell your friends about this class register for it you can email me your questions also um and we're going to learn a lot here as well all right, so um, get ready. Okay, Stephen, uh, Stephen said no questions. All right, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Right now, it's correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. Wakanda forever. And we'll talk to you next.